years of life. Satish applied a 16S rRNA sequencing strategy to determine the bacterial identity in abundance of organisms in this community. And then he used random forests, a machine learning uh, approach, applied to this 16S rRNA data set to yield a group of age discriminatory bacterial strains. And a collection of those strains is, is indicated here. And the heat map on the left indicates the abundance of those strains. And it's organized, these, these uh, profiles of abundance for these organisms are organized from uh, 1 to 24 um, months of life. So what you can easily see is that there are uh, organisms whose abundance uh, is characteristic of certain phases of life. For example, organisms here at the bottom of the list are indicative of an earlier time point in life, and organisms up here are indicative of a later time point in life. So to use these patterns, to identify a shared program of microbiota maturation. And when Satish looked at individuals from this population that were undernourished, he actually found that their maturation program was delayed. Their microbiota profile looked like that of a younger individual. Another study uh, conducted by Laura Blanton in the lab uh, suggested relationships between donor nutritional status, microbiota maturity, and growth field. So what Laura did was look at the microbiota from healthy and stunted Malawian infants transplanted into germ-free mice. Laura fed these mice uh, a macro and micronutrient deficient diet and found that even though there was no difference in food consumption, mice colonized with a microbiota from a healthy donor gained significantly more weight and lean body mass over time than mice colonized with the microbiota from a uh, a uh, stunted donor. You can see that in the plot of weight on the right, showing initial weight, percent initial weight on the y-axis in days post-colonization on the x. And you can see the healthy donors gaining significantly more weight. So I was interested in this. I was interested in the micronutrient component of this because I think it's something that we don't really understand. And I wanted to know what do we know about the role of micro the microbiota in determining the effects of dietary micronutrient deficiency. So much of what we know at this point um, is, is gained from studies of notobiotic animal models, notobiotic coming from known life. The, the value of these models is that it allows comparison between germ-free animals, that is animals that have no microbiota, and uh, animals that are colonized, mice that are colonized with an intact microbiota, either from birth or somewhere along the point of their, of their life. So studies of this type comparing colonized mice to germ-free mice have shown that, interestingly, uh, the presence of an intact microbiota can have both a benefit to the host or a detriment. For example, in the case of iron deficiency, the presence of an intact microbiota enhances iron uptake from the diet and storage and reduces anemia on low iron diets. In the case of the micronutrient folate, deficiencies in folate uh, the, micro the presence of an intact microbiota uh, ameliorates folate deficiency, and bacterial folates can actually be found in host tissues. On the contrary, uh, in the context of deficiencies of zinc or vitamin A, uh, specifically in the context of zinc deficiency, animals with a microbiota have a greater dietary zinc requirement. And finally, uh, in the context of vitamin A deficiency, the presence of an intact microbiota is is associated with increased mortality on vitamin A deficient diets. But importantly, the mechanisms of these interactions were not defined in these studies. So stated simply, we do not understand the microbiota's role in the acquisition, transport, storage, and utilization of many key dietary micronutrients. Nor do we have a deep understanding of the effects of dietary micronutrient deficiency on the microbiota itself and what such interactions might mean for the host. <coughs> this gap of knowledge could be very important for a more complete understanding of the effects of micronutrient deficiency states and for whether current treatment protocols are adequate or actually introduce unappreciated or unintended consequences for the host and the microbiota. Following from these ideas, uh, I put forth three different hypotheses. First, 
that dietary micronutrient deficiency, or content, affects the microbiota structure and function at the scale of the community and of individual community members. <laughs> Second, the effects of micronutrient deficiency on the microbiota may be recalcitrant to therapeutic interventions and might have longer-term consequences for the host. And third, that a microbiota undergoing community assembly and functional maturation, say in the first you know, two to three years of life, may be more susceptible to the effects of micronutrient deficiency and that these effects might have longer term consequences. Uh, and the studies that I'm going to describe today mainly focus on the first two of these hypotheses. So to address these hypotheses, I adopted a general approach of beginning broadly with a systems level in vivo analysis and then trying to get down to a more mechanistic, more specific look at, at, uh, at, at the ways that, these, that, that the ways that the micronutrients interact with specific bacteria. So this is going to be my roadmap for the talk today. Um, I'd like to begin by discussing efforts to identify the effects of dietary micronutrient deficiency on a defined model microbiota. Move on to talk about exploring determinants of micronutrient sensitivity in responsive strains from this community. And then finally, characterizing mechanisms by which response determinants manifest their effect in relevant bacteria. All right. So I began by creating a notobiotic mouse model of acute dietary micronutrient deficiency. This model was composed of three principal components. First, mature adult C57 black 6 germ-free mice. These mice were maintained in their germ-free state in notobiotic isolators where the microbiota could be controlled until the point in time that I colonized these mice or gavage these mice with a collection of 92 human gut-derived bacterial strains. This community was selected uh, both in size and representation to represent a fully developed microbiota. And in fact, every member of this microbiota that I gave to the mice is known. I know the identity of every individual member, and I have a genome sequence for every member of that community. So I have a high level of control over the input microbiota. And it opens up a lot of tools that I'll talk about to analyze these types of defined, fully defined communities. The third component of my model was a set of experimental diets. Uh, these diets, there were, four, there were five treatment diets. Um, each of the four of the five treatment diets was completely deficient or absent in a single micronutrient. One vitamin A, one in folate, one in zinc, and one in iron. An additional treatment diet was deficient, completely deficient in all four of those micronutrients. And in comparison, uh, I, I had a micronutrient sufficient diet of the same base composition where the levels of each of these four micronutrients was sufficient for the mouse's requirements. A couple of quick notes about diets and deficiencies. In order to get the levels of specified micronutrients completely absent, we replaced intact protein with a nutritionally sufficient amino acid mixture. Uh, a second note is that periods of deficiency, and I should describe the time course of the experiment, uh, each of my treatment groups, uh, the micronutrient sufficient animals were held on a micronutrient sufficient diet over the course of the experiment. Whereas my treat, each of my treatment groups experienced two weeks on the micronutrient sufficient diet, a three week period of their given uh, deficient diet, and then a two-week return to micronutrient-sufficient diets. My second point here is important because I don't believe that because of the length of this period of time for deficiency, uh, that there should be any true host micronutrient deficiency occurring in these time frames. So this model is really directed uh, at looking at the effects of dietary, acute dietary micronutrient deficiency on the microbiota itself. Following from this, we observed no gross pathological differences uh, or differences in mouse weights over the time course of the, of the entire experiment. All right, so the first thing I wanted to do was, was look at my microbial community over the time course of the experiment and, and see if there were any effects of my dietary treatments on the configuration or representation of bacteria in this community. In order to, to assay the community, I took advantage of a technique uh, called community profiling by sequencing, copper seek. Uh, co copper seek works by taking short read shotgun DNA sequences from the community 
uh, mapping those reads to define community genomes, uh, normalizing counts uh, in the community by the percent uniqueness of the genome in the representation of the entire community, and then finally to generate a community relative abundance profile with strain level resolution. This is a level of resolution that's just not possible using 16S analyses. What I found, and I'm showing a uh, principal coordinates analysis of Ray Curtis distances calculated from my copper seq data. I'm not going to go into detail about this technique, but what I want you to pay attention to is the grouping of colored dots in this plot. What I found was in the, in, at the end of the initial sufficient diet phase of the experiment, the colonization of the microbes into, the, into these mice, all mice, was remarkably consistent. 44 strains colonized all mice at that day, and only four additional strains colonized variably above the limit of detection. As I then exposed these mice to, to the periods of deficiency, there was a shift in the pattern, as you can see in the principal coordinate space, uh, along principal coordinate one. And then when those mice were returned to micronutrient sufficiency, they clustered in a slightly different area. One thing that's important to observe from this is that even the micronutrient sufficient group moved in this space over time. So in order to investigate more specifically what happened with individual bacteria in this community, uh, we performed, I performed, we performed, uh, within group and between group comparisons of specific bacterial abundances uh, <coughs> over time. All right, so to do this, uh, we performed, we fit mixed effects linear models to the relative abundances of bacteria over time in each experimental group. This is for individual bacteria and then used least squares means comparisons and looked for interactions between experimental group and diet phase. The results of this analysis showed that vitamin A oscillation induced the greatest effect on the abundance of community members. Additionally, Bacteroides vulgatus displayed a strong, consistent, and highly specific response to dietary vitamin A content. This was supported both by my analyses of copper seq data and by transcriptional analyses that I don't have a lot of time to talk about today, but I'll talk about or I'll touch on some very specific aspects of that later on. Interestingly, in comparisons between the sufficient, the first sufficient diet phase and the deficient, the end of the deficient diet phase, and in comparisons between the deficient diet phase and sufficient diet phase, uh, the change in, in relative abundance of Bacteroides vulgatus increased only when vitamin A was absent from experimental diets. And conversely, when those in the comparisons between the deficient phase and the sufficient phase, the relative abundance of Bacteroides vulgatus went down. So I said this, this response was highly specific. So we looked for other bacteria that had different types of responses. And interestingly, I found another closely related Bacteroides, Bacteroides dorii, that displayed an opposite response. So in the, in the comparison between sufficient and deficient diets, the relative abundance of Bacteroides dorii did not change very much when vitamin A was absent from the diet. When vitamin A was returned to the diet, its relative abundance increased. So you can see by comparison, these two closely related bacteroides are exhibiting opposite responses. Okay, so returning to my approach, um, I've showed you hopefully that dietary vitamin A content induces the greatest response in the defined community. Bacteries of Vulgatus abundance is responsive to dietary vitamin A content. So I next wanted to move toward exploring determinants of vitamin A sensitivity in Bacteroides vulgaris. But before I do, I want to start with a very brief introduction to vitamin A metabolism. So vitamin A is a class of fat-soluble compounds with retinol-like activity. Uh, retinoids, this class of fat-soluble compounds, um, exhibits diverse physiological functions related to vision, immunity, reproduction, and developmental signaling. And specific retinoids can be very potent signaling molecules. Interestingly, dietary retinoids are processed prior to their biological utility. For example, plant-derived dietary sources of vitamin A mainly exist in the form of carotenoids, 
I showed you the structure of retinol here on the top right. Carotenoids are, are typically uh, two retinol type or, or resembling molecules that are joined end to end. Carotenoids are transported first across the epithelium in the small intestine and then processed into their ultimate forms. By contrast, animal derived dietary sources are mainly in the form of retinal esters. Retinal esters enter the gut in the small intestine whereby they're processed by host enzymes into free retinol and the cognate lipid. Retinol interacts with lipids and bile in the, in the small intestine and is eventually transported. So this highlights uh, a potentially interesting feature of, of vitamin A metabolism where, where vitamin A interacts with bile in the intestine and, and uptake is actually stimulated by dietary lipids. So I want to know what the effect of different retinoids were on, on uh, my, my, uh, in, my vitamin A responsive species from my in vivo screen. So I took cultures of Bacteroides vulgatus, uh, treated them with different concentrations of various retinoids, and tracked their growth over time. So these are very standard bacterial growth curves. And what I found was compared to a control treatment with DMSO, Treatment of these cultures with retinal palmitate had a small but significant effect of growth on growth. Retinal, which differs from the retinal structure I've shown here only by the terminal uh, oxygen state, <coughs> had a, a stronger effect on growth, a, a longer delay on the growth of this organism. And then finally, retinol at the concentration that I'm showing here, 10 micromolar, which is the treatment range is guided uh, by measuring values from mouse and human feces and small intestinal content, retinol at this concentration completely inhibited the growth of bacteria small guys. In order to make these curves a little bit more interpretable, to allow me to compare between different retinoids and different species or strain responses to these retinoids, I parameterized the curves by calculating, by drawing a threshold at an ODE of 0.3, an optical density of 0.3, and then normalizing the time it took for a treated culture to cross that threshold to the time it take, took for the control culture to cross that threshold. And I've plotted these in bar charts. You'll see a lot of these over the course of the talk, so I wanted to make them hopefully clear now. Uh, a higher retinol or compound sensitivity on this axis indicates a greater sensitivity to that compound and more growth inhibition, whereas a lower bar, a smaller bar on this axis, indicates less sensitivity to that treatment compound and, and, and faster growth or lower inhibition. So I've summarized the retinoid screening that I performed with Bacteroides vulgatus and another Bacteroides that I'll talk about in a second here. So as you can see again, greater sensitivity equals more inhibition, lower sensitivity equals less inhibition. And you can see that, as I showed before, Bacteroides vulgatus is is highly inhibited, the growth of Bacteroides vulgatus is highly inhibited by a high concentration treatment with retinol, less so by retinol, and very little but statistically significant effect of retinal palmitite. By comparison, Bacteroides dorii exhibits statistically significantly less sensitivity to these compounds than Bacteroides vulgatus, each of the three compounds and at all the concentrations I tested. Uh, importantly, these in vitro sensitivities actually match my expectation based on in vivo abundance responses, where Bacteroides of vulgatus did better in the community when vitamin A was absent from the diet, whereas Bacteroides dorii did, did, um, did better when vitamin A was present in the, did better than Bacteroides vulgatus when vitamin A was present in the diet. We extended this to look at a, uh, at a age and growth discriminatory Bacteroides vulgatus strain isolated uh, based on its presence in random forest models of Malawian microbiota maturation and showed that the sensitivity of this primary isolate uh, was on par, this, the, the sensitivity of this primary isolate to retinol was on par with what we observed for the type strain Bacteroides vulgatus that I used in my primary experiments. Okay. So having, um, excuse me. Having begun to explore the vitamin A sensitivity of Bacteroides vulgatus in vitro, 
I wanted then to apply this, this knowledge to identifying determinants of retinol sensitivity in this organism. We decided to do this by utilizing uh, transposon mutagenesis libraries. So the first task was to generate, generate a factor useful guise insertion sequencing library. To do this, we adapted a transposon mutagenesis vector, PSAM BT, uh, for use in Bacteroides vulgatus. And then we mutagenized Bacteroides vulgatus by conjugation and transposition, generating a library of 30,300 isogenic mutants containing, where each mutant contained one insertion site in the genome. This library uh, covered 71% of predicted open reading frames at a mean uh, independent insertions per open reading frame of 10.5. Now this is not, each open reading frame had 10 concurrent insertions. Each mutant contains a single insertion and on average for each open reading frame that was hit in the library, there were 10 independent insertions, 10 independent mutants in that open reading frame. So one of the powerful things about INSEQ is the analytical side of INSEQ, this transposon mutagenesis and assay approach, is that you can uh, analyze these libraries um, to obtain the, abundance, in, the abundance and the identity of each mutant in the output library, and thus obtain information about genes that are critical for fitness under selection supply. One of the unique features, uh, the key feature perhaps of this type of approach is that the in-seq transposon encodes restriction enzyme recognition sites for the MME1 enzyme. When you digest these um, DNA sequences with MME1, you can extract then the sequence surrounding the site of transposition and then use the, the following workup to identify um, the abundance of that particular mutant in the library and its identity. You can then take these uh, these libraries subject them to different types of, of uh, growth and growth treatments in vitro and then assay the output library on the other end to see what, what the representation of mutants in the library has changed. All right. So I took my, <coughs> my in-seq library of Bacteroides vulgatus and subjected it to two rounds of selection under, under an inhibitory concentration of retinol and, and uh, extracted samples and performed in-seq analysis during the lag phase and stationary phase of the primary culture. And then after that culture was subcultured into fresh media of the same treatment, I sampled during the log phase and then again during the stationary phase. I did this three independent times. And what I found, interestingly, is in one of my replicates, one mutant assumed almost 100% abundance in the community um, by the end of the second uh, culture time. In additional biological, in additional selection of the library, a different mutant rose to almost 100% abundance. And in my third biological replicate, or my third replicate, um, two different mutants <coughs> assumed together approximately in equal proportions Again, 100% abundance in, in the selected library. I isolated these mutants from the in-seq library and checked their retinol sensitivity as I have before and found that each of these mutants, and the colors match up between here and here, each of these mutants displayed significantly less retinol sensitivity than the wild type parent strain. I then asked, um, what the, what the genomic context of these mutations was. And I found that the four in-seq mutants identified in my selections mapped to two adjacent genes in the Bacteroides vulgatus genome, LPXA and ACRR. LPXA is a UDP and acetylglucosamine acyl transferase involved in lipid A biosynthesis. And ACRR is a TEDR family transcription factor involved in the regulation of uh, predicted to be involved in the regulation of multidrug effluents. These two genes, interestingly, are resident in a locus containing two, containing the annotated components of two ACRAB type, uh, ACRAB 12C type efflux pump systems. So ACRAB, the, the canonical ACRAB 12C system in E. coli 
and uh, annotated components here um, are ACRB, which is the inner membrane transporter of this, of this FLUX system, TOLSI, which is an outer membrane channel, and ACRA, which is a periplasmic adaptive protein that connects ACRB and TOLSI. Importantly, ACRR in the canonical system is a transcriptional repressor of the expression of these components. And importantly, um, this type of efflux system has broad substrate range for xenobiotics and biopsies. So, <clears throat> considering the context of these insertion mutants um, and the fact that the Retinol sensitivity was the same or very similar between the two. The, the, two, the different insertions in the different genes had a very similar effect on retinol sensitivity. I hypothesized that ACRR was actually driving this response, uh, this change in sensitivity, and that effects on, of insertions in LPXA, insertion of the in-seq transposon in LPXA, were actually acting in a polar fashion on ACRR. So, to, get, to confirm my suspicions about the effect of ACRR on retinol sensitivity, I used a chromosomally um, integrating expression vector where the ACRR sequence was fused to the promoter region of the Bevel goddess RPOD to complement my mutants. And as you can see, the wild type strain exhibits greater <coughs> retinol sensitivity than my ACRR insertion mutant. The ACRR insertion mutant complemented with empty vector had no change in its retinol sensitivity, but complementing this same mutant with the uh, ACRR sequence driven by the RPOD promoter restored retinol sensitivity to wild type levels. So at this point, I've identified a number of the, of the Tedar family of transcriptional repressors that affects retinol sensitivity in Bacteroides vulgatus. I wondered uh, the following questions. Are the efflux pumps in this locus members of the regulon of ACRR? What other genes belong to the ACRR regulon? And finally, do gene expression patterns of ACRR mutants in vitro mirror any patterns that I observed in, in vivo transcriptional studies that I haven't had a, big, a lot of time to talk about today? So I performed in vitro RNA-seq, where I took cultures of Bacteroides vulgatus wild type, the ACRR mutant, and the LPXA insertion mutant from my in-seq schemes, and grew them under plus or minus retinol conditions, extracted samples from these cultures at, at mid-log phase, and then performed RNA-seq on them uh, to get a transcriptional profile of these mutants. I'm showing here the expression pattern of the locus, and the locus map is, is here on the bottom. The counts that I'm uh, showing are DC normalized uh, transcriptional counts. And then you can see the Bacteroides vulgatus wild type cultures in white, uh, the ACRR N cultures in red or orange, and the B vulgatus LPXA cultures in pink green. Um, and what you can easily see is that 240, uh, the ACRR mutant here, and the LPXA mutant here, the components of the ACRAB Tulsi system upstream of those insertions are upregulated in each of the mutants compared to wild. Interestingly, the downstream ACRAB Tulsi system is downregulated. However, I can't uh, differentiate from this study any effect of polar insertion on these genes from a bona fide transcriptional um, uh, downregulation. I wanted to look more broadly and ask whether, or ask what the broader regulon of ACRR is in these, uh, in these mutant strains. <clears throat> and in order to do so, I wanted to differentiate any effect of inactivating the LPXA enzyme uh, from polar effects uh, on ACRR. So I transcriptionally profiled, these are the same experiments, I, I looked at this transcriptional profile and the differential expression of genes in the transcriptional profile of ACRR and LPXA, 
and then took the differentially expressed genes that were shared and functionally summarized them using mapping to the Kyoto uh, Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes to get both pathway level summarizations and gene and uh, function, <coughs> function level summarizations. And found a, uh, a large grouping of differentially expressed genes into four different pathways, amino sugar and nucleotide metabolism, cationic antimicrobial peptide resistance, uh, sulfur and purine metabolism, and alanine aspartate and glutamine metabolism. And I'm gonna highlight two sets of genes from these. First, uh, from the cation antimicrobial peptide resistance and beta-lactam resistance uh, pathway, the genes that correspond to the um, upstream acrad 12 c component of the locus. And additionally, interestingly, a set of genes involved in sulfate assimilation. Uh, importantly, 24 components of this broad regulon were also differentially expressed by B. vulgatus in, in vivo, uh, comparing vitamin A sufficient and deficient conditions. All right, so a complementary analysis was also performed to support our, our view of the regulon of ACRR, where we took uh, ACRR sequences of Bacteroides vulgatus and looked for orthologous sequences in other bac Bacteroides. We used the upstream sequences of these genes because we know that ACRR is typically autoregulated to generate, uh, to look for a consensus binding site, a consensus predicted binding site of, of this gene, of this um, transcription factor and then used the position weight uh, matrix of this predicted binding site to look for other high scoring predicted binding sites in other bacteroides genomes. Uh, and so here I'm showing just a select set of those uh, for bacteroides vulgatus, bacteroides dorii, and bacteroides theta iota omicron. So what we found was that ACRR orthologs generally reside in loci containing acrab 12 c machinery. This seems to be a general feature of bacteroides and not necessarily surprising given what we know about ACRR. Additionally, the relevant regions in other bacteroides adopt multiple configurations. For example, in B theta here, you can see that the two ACRAB Tulsi systems are split uh, compared to the way that they're oriented in Bacteroides vulgatus and Bacteroides doria. So in B-theta, these are in two different regions of the genome, both preceded by a high scoring predicted binding site. Additionally, in B. vulgatus, B. doria, and B-theta, um, an additional locus is preceded by a high scoring ACRR binding site and actually contains the same sulfate assimilation machinery that I talked about being upregulated in my transcriptional studies from, from before. Okay. So next we wanted to ask, <coughs> next I wanted to ask how the binding activity of ACRR is controlled in bacteroides. So to do this, we performed fluorescence polarization and electrophoretic mobility shift assays in collaboration with individuals uh, at the Sanford Burnham, Andre, Andre Osterman and, and Zhao Xing Li. And what we found that was with purified ACRR protein from Bacteroides vulgatus uh, bound to uh, the upstream region of the <coughs> BVU240 locus uh, in a concentration-dependent manner. A truncated variant of this protein that, that did not contain, or that did not contain a complete um, uh, DNA binding domain did not bind, that's the red bar, and then a uh, cultures or purified protein treated with a DNA sequence from a, an unrelated, unrelated locus also did not bind. Uh, importantly, we found no effect of retinol treatment on the binding of this transcription factor to its target DNA. We supported these studies by electrophoretic mobility shift assay. And the way electrophoretic mobility shift assay works is that when a protein interacts with a DNA that it binds, you should see a shift in the apparent uh, weight or behavior on the gel of that bound complex. So you can see here that 
the ACRR protein isolated from Bacteroides dorii binds the uh, expected target sequence from Bacteroides vulgatus and Bacteroides dorii. These are very similar sequences. The same is true for back the protein isolated from or purified from Bacteroides vulgatus. Importantly, we found that in these electrophoretic mobility shift assays, a less than three kilodalton filtered cell extract from both species uh, decreased the binding of this transcription factor to its target sequence. And work with this is, is ongoing. Okay. So returning to my roadmap once again, uh, I hope that I've shown that InSeq has identified ACRR as a determinant of vitamin A sensitivity in Bacteroides vulgatus associated with regulation of the ACRAB Tulsi efflux pump. Finally, I want to talk about efforts to characterize the mechanism by which ACRR affects vitamin A sensitivity in Bacteroides vulgatus. <coughs> so to, to uh, study the direct effects of ACRAB Tulsi activity on retinol efflux, we grew, I grew um, cultures of Bacteroides vulgatus, uh, ACRR, and complemented ACRR mutants. I took my cultures, diluted them, or spun them down, resuspended them in um, PBS cysteine, and then treated those cultures with retinol. And then with the help of Jia Chen, uh, we performed targeted mass spectrometry assays to measure the change in retinol concentration in cell-free supernatants of these cultures over time. The results are shown here. You can see on the y-axis retinol in cell-free supernatants as a percent of the initial measure, and then time along the x-axis for each individual culture. And what I found, what we found, was that only in the ACRR mutant, where the ACRAB Tulsi machinery is upregulated, did we see an increase in the retinol and sulfur supernatant. This was not observed in the wild type cultures or in the complemented cultures. I then asked, can we sensitize a resistant organism to retinol by inhibition of efflux? So to do this, I wanted to take advantage of the fact that comparisons between retinol sensitive organisms like Bacteroides vulgatus and retinol resistant organisms like Bacteroides doria provides an enticing framework for identifying activities that control sensitivity. There are two related questions that come from this. First, how does the activity of ACRAB Tulsi, or more broadly, efflux, affect the growth of organisms in defined medium conditions? This is a control type experiment. And second, can inhibition of ACRAB Tulsi sensitize retinol resistant organisms <coughs> like Bacteroides doria to retinol treatment? So I identified a compound, uh, phenylalanine arginine beta naphthalamide, that I'll abbreviate PA beta N, uh, is a broad inhibitor of multidrug efflux, including ACRAB Tulsi type multidrug efflux. <coughs> I treated cultures in the same way that I had before um, of Bacteroides vulgatus and Bacteroides dorii with PA beta N of increasing, of increasing concentration, and then um, generated sensitivity data, like I had before, greater sensitivity in indicating the greater inhibition of growth, uh, lower sensitivity indicating less inhibition of growth, and found that there was a small but statistically significant effect of increasing treatment with PA beta N on the growth of Bacteroides vulgatus, um, but no significant effect on the growth of Bacteroides doric. When I combined the PA beta N treatment, with retinol treatment at, an, at a concentration inhibitory to Bacteroides vulgatus wild type, I observed no additional effect, as might be expected, of PA beta N treatment on the completely inhibited cultures of Bacteroides vulgatus. But I observed a dose dependent increase in sensitivity to retinol of Bacteroides dorii on treatment with PA beta N, suggesting that inhibition of multidrug efflux contributes to the sensitivity. Uh, of these organisms to retinol. Okay, so these results lead me to a proposed model for in vivo interactions between vitamin A sensitive and resistant organisms, bile and vitamin A. 
So under vitamin A sufficient diet conditions, retinal esters enter the small intestine, are processed, as I showed before, into retinol. Retinol interacts with, with lipids and bile, and in the course of these interactions uh, and transport, interacts with bacteria in, in the distal small intestine or possibly the proximal colon. Uh, sensitive organisms like Bacteroides vulgatus, shown in blue here, um, are inhibited or killed by these interactions, leading to communities uh, that are measurable further down the gut where resistant organisms like Bacteroides dorii prevail. Under circumstances of vitamin A deficiency, less retinal esters enter the gut, the small intestine, and there's less free retinol liberated by host enzymes. The selective pressure of these interactions on sensitive and resistant organisms is not present under these conditions, and there's no favoritism for retinol-resistant organisms uh, under these conditions, and retinol-sensitive organisms uh, can take a greater hold in the community. So knowing what we know about <coughs> these uh, possible interactions between retinol and bile, and what we know about interactions between retinol and Bacteroides vulgatus and Bacteroides doria, I wonder if in fact bile might participate in retinol bacterial interactions both in vivo and if I can measure those in vitro. Uh, importantly, ACRAB activity in other species is a documented determinant of bile resistance. We look back with GS help again in samples from my initial um, micronutrient deficiency diet screen and found that the relative abundance of the bile acid toro beta muricolic acid was actually significantly up in my vitamin A deficient group in my multiple, a, multiple deficient group compared to my micronutrient sufficient group at the end of the diet of the micronutrient deficiency diet phase of the experiment. So to get at this with my bacteroides in kind of a crude way, I took cultures of Bacteroides vulgatus, Bacteroides dorii, and Bacteroides fragilis as a bile uh, prototypical bile-resistant control, and the ACRR mutant of Bacteroides vulgatus. I smeared these, or I spread these cultures on plates, and then used a bile-impregnated disc placed in the center of each plate to look for a zone of inhibition around that disc. And I've quantified bile sensitivity here as the diameter of that zone of inhibition around the disc. And what I found was bile sensitivity actually tracked quite well with retinol sensitivity in these organisms. Whereas Bacteroides vulgatus, wild type, was most sensitive, most sensitive uh, had the greatest zone of inhibition around that bile <coughs> disc. Bacteroides doria had a significantly less of a response to, or less of an, an inhibition by bile, that bile impregnated disc, and the ACRR mutant of Bacteroides vulgatus displayed an intermediate response. So these studies suggest a number of remaining questions in future directions. Um, I've plotted where I've put this out as my questions and then proposed experiments um, that should or uh, could be done to address these questions. First, what is the mechanism of toxicity of retinol for bacterial cells? I would propose that in vitro studies to investigate interactions between bile, retinol, and wild type and existing mutants of B. vulgatus compared to wild type Bacteroides dorii might help to get at this question. Additionally, high resolution proteomics studies that are already in progress might suggest the outside possibility that Bacteroides vulgatus proteins are actually modified by retinol as it makes its way into the cell. Next, what factors might differentiate sensitive and resistant organisms? Uh, I would propose that further study of the low molecular <coughs> components of B. vulgatus and B. dorii cellular extracts uh, and the effects of these extracts on ACRR binding by fluorescence polarization, polarization assays and electrophoretic mobility shift assays might help to differentiate um, sensitive and resistant organisms like Bacteroides vulgatus and Bacteroides dorica. Additionally, 
Further ACRR binding studies, including treatment with bile acids now, identified as differentially represented in vivo during dietary vitamin A deficiency, might suggest <clears throat> the actual ligands of ACRR, or might suggest that bile acids uh, influence the binding of ACRR. And then additionally, in vitro QRT-PCR studies to investigate basal differences in regulation or activity of, of efflux uh, or other regulon components in sensitive versus resistant organisms might help to illuminate the differences um, between these types of organisms. And then third, uh, what are the consequences for interactions between vitamin A and bacteria for the host? Um, to get at this question, I would suggest 16S rRNA studies of the fecal microbiota of vitamin A deficient humans or humans experiencing high dose vitamin A supplementation to look for signatures in the microbial communities of these different types of, of deficiency or supplementation states. Or follow on studies from these first type where microbes isolated from the above individuals could be studied further with dietary manipulations of vitamin A content in notobiotic mice. In closing, uh, these studies emphasize the importance of exploring the effects of specific dietary micronutrient deficiencies on microbial communities. A direct and accessible path for further exploration lies with notobiotic animals colonized with either defined communities of human gut microbes isolated as age or identified as age and growth discriminatory and using the same types of analytical techniques that I've described in my talk today and or uh, intact uncultured microbial communities from healthy and malnourished individuals. Ultimately, I believe that an improved understanding of these types of interactions between dietary micronutrients and the gut microbiota may inform new approaches to effectively treat or prevent deficiency associated disease. There are a number of individuals that I feel are more than deserving of acknowledgement. First, members of the Gordon Lab who contributed to this project, Meng Wu for assistance with INSEE, Maria Carlson, David O'Donnell, Sabrina Wagner, and Justin Cerugo for help with notobiotic husbandry, uh, Nate McNulty for assistance with copper seed, Jay Faye for assistance with RNA seed, Janaki Wala Garouge for assistance with anaerobic microbiology, Nick Griffin for help with data analysis, and GHM for lots of work with mass spec. In the Center for Genome Sciences and Systems Biology, Jess Blazing de Lopez and Sue Deming for assistance with sequencing, and Eric Martin and Brian Kobe uh, for uh, computational support. We've, I've been fortunate enough to work with some uh, really great collaborators, Barb Mickelson and, and Vigo, who helped formulate our experimental diets, uh, Dimitri Rodinoff, Zhao Ching Li, Andre Osterman at Sanford Burnham for help with comparative genomics in the transcription factor binding studies, and Eric Martens at Michigan for help with genetic tools for complementing bacteria's Vulgatus mutants. I also owe a debt of gratitude for my, to my thesis committee, Dan Goldberg, Jeff Henderson, Scott Holprin, Laura Iannotti, Clay Semenkovich, and Gavin Dantas for help uh, advising my project along the way, in particular Dan for serving as my chair. <coughs> I have to thank Jeff. Um, Jeff, it's been a great experience being in the lab over the last five years. Um, I've grown a lot, uh, both per personally and professionally, uh, under your careful guidance, and it's really been a, a wonderful experience to be part of the Gordon Lab family. I've also had a number of uh, really uh, important friends, supportive friends, lifelong friends that I found uh, during my time at, at WashU in graduate school, both in the lab and, uh, and outside of it. I've been fortunate enough um, to have a very supportive family, both Ashley's and my home, um, my mom, my dad, and my sister, um, who supported me and encouraged me along every step of the way. And then finally, um, I really do dedicate this work to my wife, Ashley, who also has supported me every, every step of the way, has gone and above and beyond um, to be there for me and support me when I needed her. Uh, and and, uh, and I, to her, I owe the greatest debt of gratitude. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll take questions.
Are there any questions from uh, the assembled multitude? Thank God, man. You, uh, <laughs> um, Philip. Hey, Do you think what they're pumping back out is exactly what they took in? Do you think the small molecule all the way away from the pump is actually activated? The transmission factor is not that way. So I don't have any data necessarily to speak to the conversion of retinol by bacterial cells. Those are some studies that we're, we're interested in. Um, G and I have looked for uh, breakdown products of retinol or things like that, and we haven't been able to identify anything that we can specifically attribute. Um, so I, I can't rule it out, um, but it, it, it's certainly a possibility that there's some conversion uh, of, of retinol in the course of interacting with bacterial cells. And the, the greater implication of that um, would be for, for possible effects on, on bioavailability of vitamin A in the gut. Um, just to link to that, is there anything known about whether germ treatments were easier or more difficult to make it in the addition I'm not aware of any studies of that type. The studies I'm aware of are more uh, uh, concerned with the longevity of colonized versus germ free animals. Um, if you look at <coughs> the sequences of ACR between your focus and the most resistance one, mm -hmm. um, do they, does that suggest that there are differences in ACR, the regulation? So we haven't uh, been able to attribute uh, sequence differences in the transcription factor between the two organisms. Um, to accounting for the retinal sensitivity. They're actually very highly related proteins. I think there are only three substitutions over the course of the, of the protein sequence. Um, so we haven't been able to attribute any specific differences. It's probably something somewhere else in the regulation of these types of systems that, that accounts for that sensitivity. Yeah. I'm going to ask a bilateral question because, I, because we, that might have to be. Sure. Um, I noticed that the, there was a change in the, in the acid composition, and do you think it's the vitamin A that, it, or the retinol that's actually, because the bile acid sensitivity correlated with the vitamin A sensitivity, so vitamin A is carried on my cell, so is it, is it, well, we did these experiments separately, but there's obviously some connection, yeah. and the fact that the bile acid became more hydrophilic, um, it just, it's just, what's the connection, or do you have any clues as to yeah. these two are related? Sure, so the, the connection starts with, with knowing that these compounds interact in vivo, that retinol and bile acids will likely interact at some point in vivo. Um, and the, the, the experiments that I'm interested in pursuing related to that um, are the ones I described where I want to combine now um, treatment with, with bile acids and retinol and the effects of my bacteria in vitro. Um, I can't necessarily speak to any types of signaling interactions in vivo that might affect um, uh, from retinol or the effects of bacteria that might affect um, the production of bile acids, but bacteria are certainly known to convert bile acids between different forms. Um, so it may be, um, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at, at fecal profiles, it would be much better to be able to look at, at fecal profiles, um, much more proximal in the gut, and see if there are any, any uh, <coughs> effects of vitamin A deficiency on bile acid profiles. Um, but I don't have uh, a lot of knowledge up front of necessarily what vitamin A deficiency would, would do to affect bile acid production directly. Megan. Uh, um, so just thinking about kind of the fitness of your ACR, so we also have a big advantage in the presence of retinol. Right. Um, what kind of uh, context do you think they might have a fitness disadvantage? That's a good question. So that, that gets at uh, kind of what the, what the typical function of these efflux pumps might be uh, in different contexts. Um, so, you know, these are really broad substrate range efflux pumps. Um, it certainly seems like uh, it would be very important to carefully and specifically regulate those efflux pumps so they don't pump out anything that a bacterial cell wouldn't want to lose. Um, so it seems like my studies in inhibiting efflux in bacteria's bogatus showed some small effects on, on, uh, on growth characteristics in defined medium conditions. Um, it could certainly be that uh, 
careful control of these systems is important to retain compounds that are important to the, to the fitness of, of people goddess. Um, but I'm not sure what those specific compounds might be. Well, thank you very much for your attention. We appreciate it.